There's a poem in your insert called The Maker of the Universe. The maker of the universe, as man for man, was made a curse. The claims of law which he had made, unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bough which grew the thorns which crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head, by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face, by his decree was poised in space. The spear which spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rocks his hands had made. The throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years. But a new glory crowns his brow and every knee to him shall bow. Lord, we pray the help of your Holy Spirit to take words that have become almost too familiar and make them profound and transformational to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's get context. The cosmos, everything that is created, the entire created order, which science is now telling us is infinitely more vast than we ever could imagine, millions and millions, and they say billions of galaxies, is bounded by an eternal God, a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who has existed from all eternity. And in this vast, vast cosmos with these millions and billions of galaxies, and galaxies are so big we cannot imagine it, there is the galaxy that we live in, called the Milky Way. If we could be billions of light years away and look back on, back on it, we'd see it's a spiral galaxy, beautiful galaxy, and in one of those spiral arms is a medium-sized star. It's not particularly of any consequence compared to other stars. And yet this medium-sized star has a family of planets around it. It's our solar system. It's where we live. And the third planet out from that medium-sized star is a medium-sized planet in the galaxy, in the solar system. And it's the planet that we live on. We call it home. It's planet Earth. It's a speck of dust in the universe. It's not even a speck of dust in the universe. It's inconsequentially small. And yet... On this speck of dust, call earth, our home, this eternal God made life. We have no idea if he made it anywhere else. We don't know if he made it anywhere else, but we know he made it here. He made it here. Didn't come about by accident. And he not only made life here, but he made human life here. And we understand from the Bible that human life is is the crown of everything he ever created. On this speck of dust, in this one galaxy out of billions, God in his inscrutable wisdom created beings, moral creatures in his image. That's what a human is. We are divine image bearers. We're not just animals. We are divine image bearers made on this planet, God-made beings that could respond to him. And in his wisdom, he gave these beings, human beings, moral agency. We can make choices. We don't know if he's done this anywhere else in the, in the universe. We don't know if this has happened any other place. And God, in his wisdom said, I will allow these moral agents, 
the most important thing I ever created on this speck of dust in this galaxy, in this universe, there. There's the most important thing I ever made. I will allow them to rebel. I will allow them to rebel, and I will not restrict the rebellion. It will be unbelievable, the rebellion that will happen on that speck of dust. And we could talk about, we, we, could hit, we could list it, Hitler, Genghis Khan, you, me, the fight you had yesterday in your kitchen with your spouse, all the things. And I will allow the full force of rebellion to take place on that speck of dust so that on that speck of dust I can display what can only be displayed in such a place, and that is my redeeming grace. My redeeming grace cannot be displayed in a good place. It can only be displayed in a bad place. The profundity of my mercy cannot be displayed unless a place is allowed to go as bad, as horribly bad as we can imagine. And that's the scene we're living on. We are living on the focal point of all creation. We're center stage. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? And on this planet, God has displayed the most profound thing about his nature. The most profound thing about his nature. And it is this, that he has mercy on sinners. That's the most profound thing about God. It's profound that God is eternal. That's profound. It's a pro profound that God is beautiful. That's profound. It's profound that God is all-powerful. That's profound. It's profound that God can create all things from nothing. That's profound. But what is the most profound thing of all is that God has mercy on sinners. And that could not be displayed anywhere except in a venue where things had gone completely wrong. And God did not say, well, I'll just let things go a little bit wrong. I will let them go completely wrong. And God is faithful to his purposes, and here are his purposes, to display his saving love to his glory and to the good of the whole universe. Those are his purposes. And we get to John chapter 19. And this is not God's plan B. This is God's plan A. And these things are written, John chapter 20, verse 31, so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing we will have life in his name. Oh, I hope that we get some sort of sense of what we're caught up in here today. We are caught up. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are caught up in the glorious display of the mercy of God to the praise of God in the heavenly realms forever and ever and ever. Your center stage. So here is Jesus. Romans chapter 5. Verses 6 to 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for the rebels on the rebel planet. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die. But God shows his love for this, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here's the display of God's glory. And if there are beings out there somewhere, and I think there might be, these are, we are the fallen beings, and they are gazing upon the most profound news in all the universe, that God has had mercy on the rebel planet. God has displayed his grace. And he did it through the incarnation of his eternal son. Father, son, and Holy Spirit. God is eternally a father with an eternal son in the fellowship of the eternal Holy Spirit. And the eternal son of God came to the rebel planet.
planet. That's what Christmas is all about. That's why we're going to celebrate it. The incarnation of God through Christ here on a saving mission. And as we get to John chapter 19, this is the culmination of the saving work of God. And it's like it happened yesterday. Don't think, oh, this is ancient news. This happened yesterday in the scheme of things. And it's presented as history. John is so careful, as all the New Testament writers are, John is so careful to demonstrate that Jesus is the fulfillment of the entire redemptive history of God. He's the fulfillment. This is not an accident. This is not plan B. God never went, oops, when earth went wrong. Before the foundations of the earth, this was in the heart and mind of the triune God. And the whole nature of John, I love all the Gospels because they're, they're clearly eyewitness accounts. I have staked my life on this being true. And I trust you will too. And millions of others are doing the same. And let the earth laugh. But they don't have an answer. What's the answer for evil? What's the answer for our plight? It's found here in revealed scripture. So we begin. Jesus goes outside the city bearing our sins. So they took Jesus, verse 16, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the skull. And there they crucified him with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. This is the eternal son of God, the creator of everything that has ever been created. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Christians believe. Who's come to the rebel planet to display the saving grace of God because God in his mercy said, I must atone for sin. Sin is no joke to God. It's not something God shrugs his shoulders at and says, oh, don't worry about it. I'm gracious. No, sin is paid for. As far as we know, as far as we know, creation cost God nothing. Redemption costs God Christ. It costs the Son of God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify people through his blood. He carried the cross, our sin, outside and away. Isaiah 53, verse 12. He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Those thieves on each side, that's us. Christ is numbered with us, crucified for us. By the way, you remember Luke's gospel tells us one of those thieves turned to Jesus and prayed a nine-word prayer. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Nine words. And Jesus said in dying words, today you will be with me in paradise. You don't have to pray a fancy prayer to get the heart of God, but you need to mean what you pray. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. If you are a believer in Jesus, you are no longer under the curse of sin. Amen? Come on. Whatever your dad did and your grandpa did and your grandmother did and your whoever way back, you are delivered from that through faith in Christ. You are free. Both of my grandfathers were alcoholics. Both of my wife's grandfathers were alcoholics. Both of our dads were delivered and were born into horrible situations. We are free from the curse of all that through Jesus. You're free from the curse of your past and what you've done. All the things that you wish you had never done. If they were put up on a screen, you would be ashamed forever and you'd flee to the hills. All dealt with by this event. Christ on the cross, bearing your sin, your shame, 
your curse. Walk in freedom. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. A ransom. I buy you back from slavery to sin. I buy you back with my blood. And I set you free. That's what's happening here. And it's happening on this planet. And it's happening to believers. And I trust it's happened to you. Well, Pilate... This is history. Redemption happened in history. It didn't happen in a philosophy class. It didn't happen with some ideas. It happened in history. Pilate, he puts a sign on the cross. It's written in three languages. In Aramaic, that's the language of the people. That's the language of faith. It's written in Greek. That's the common language of the Roman Empire. That's the language of commerce. And it's written in language. That's the official language legal language of Rome. It's written, that's the language of power. And the sign says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And the Jews came to him and said, take that sign down. We don't like it. And sign, Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. He didn't realize what he was saying. He was proclaiming, this is the Messiah of Israel. This is him. This is the one. Remember the angel came to Mary we're going to talk about this in a month or two at Christmas also. Luke 1.32, the Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will never end. Pilate proclaimed unwittingly the most glorious truth of all. This Jesus is the savior of God's people and the culmination of all God's promises. Now, Israel refused to receive Jesus because they wanted a geopolitical savior. They wanted a savior who would do what they wanted. And that's why people don't receive Jesus today. We want a mini God, a mascot, not a master, who will do what we want. And let me say right now, just so you're sure about this, as long as you are trying to make Jesus into a servant of your agenda, you are creating an imaginary Jesus who doesn't exist, and your imaginary Jesus is sure to disappoint you. And at that point, you'll walk away from your fake Jesus saying, I tried Christianity and it didn't work, but you didn't try it. Jesus has not come to serve your agenda or my agenda. He has come to fulfill the faithfulness of the Father in making atonement for the sin of the world. And we must fall in line with him. The Jews suffered from a disease. It was called hardening of the categories. They had a category for God. God has to do things our way. And if he doesn't do things our way, then crucify Jesus. And we can suffer from the same. We can make our categories for how God should act politically, socially, health-wise in my life, financially. God, you better do all these things for me. And if you don't, I'm done with you. You dare not do it. You dare make sure that your mind is informed by the Bible so that you're continually reformed by truth and transformed into a new creature and conformed into the very image of Christ. Or you will say what the Jews said, away with Jesus. Away with Jesus. He didn't come to serve our ideas. He came to make atonement for sin and be faithful to the saving purposes of God. Pilate didn't realize that he was proclaiming Jesus as the fulfillment of of all the Old Testament to the whole world, but he was. And then they take his robe and they bargain for it. The soldiers who crucified Jesus took his garments, divided them into four parts, one for each soldier, and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. And so they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it. Jesus, here, this is a little picture of the gospel here. Jesus provides a robe for sinners. 
Jesus provides a robe for sinners. And did you know that he's provided a robe for you? Not a robe like that tunic, but Isaiah 61, verse 10, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation, and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. When Christ was crucified on the cross, bearing those crucifying tortures, he was taking our sin and giving us his righteousness. That robe that they took was emblematic of a robe that Christ gives us. We don't come to God in our own righteousness. We come to God through Christ's righteousness, which he gives us as a gift which was provided through the crucifixion of Jesus. Psalm 22, verse 8, they divided my garments among them and they cast lots from for my clothing. What an amazing thing is the crucifixion of Jesus. I would imagine that angels in the farthest reaches of our galaxy Behold this forever and continually. Do you? Are you bored with it? Have you forgotten it? And then Jesus provides a home for his mother. He gives his mother to John. And by the way, John took that seriously. Just a little historical note here. He moved to Ephesus, became the bishop of Ephesus, and Mary lived her days out with him. And that's probably where Luke went to get all of his information to write his gospel. He talked to Mary about it there. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things was now finished, and to fulfill the scripture, said, I thirst. And a jar of sour wine stood there. They put a sponge of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Oh, let's stay here for a few minutes. Let's not rush. I know the time is almost gone, but we, we must stay. Literally, these are, these are such deep gospel words. It is finished. Notice he didn't say, I am finished. I'm finished. It is finished. The word there, tetelestai, literally was stamped on the bottom of invoices in Bible days when they were paid off. They would stamp the very word that Jesus said there. Paid in full. It is finished. Done. What is finished? The saving plan and purposes of God from eternity fat past finished all this great scheme. Finished right there with the death of of Christ on the cross, paid in full. Your sin, your calamity, your rebellion, the things that would give God a case against you for all eternity have been dealt with by Jesus Christ on the cross. It is finished, paid in full. Full, what glorious, glorious gospel words. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. He appeared once at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The two greatest problems that a pastor has, the two greatest are as follows, to help people understand that they really are guilty before a holy God. They really are. Number two, to help people understand that Christ really has dealt with the guilt. That we might walk in utter glorious freedom. It is finished. It is finished. That is the work of man's redemption and salvation is now complete Full satisfaction is made to the justice of God regarding your sin and mine. A fatal blow has been given to the power of Satan, and a fountain of grace has been opened which shall forever flow 
forever flow, and a foundation of peace and happiness is laid which shall never fail. Do you believe it? Now, again, I do know, and Chad, you did say that they did prove they could raise their hands this morning. But we prove that every Sunday at Chiefs games. There is absolutely nothing wrong with our ability to express our emotion. We've just misplaced it. We've put it in transient things that don't matter. And yet here's something that is of unbelievable glory and worth. To the praise of God in the heavenly realms forever and ever and ever. And we're caught up in it. We're caught up in it if we're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're still bearing your own sin. Why would you do that? Why would you leave here today without saying, I've got to get this dealt with. I have to get this dealt with. I have to give this to Jesus and let him be my sin bearer. As we stay on these words, it is finished for just a moment. We will go to Psalm 22. I, I am aware of our time. I, I won't go longer, much longer. Psalm 22. It's the psalm that Jesus owned when he was on the cross. Remember when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember that? It's not in John's gospel. It's in the other John's gospel. He was beginning to quote Psalm 22. And in quoting the first line of Psalm 22, he was embracing the whole psalm as his. It's as though if you were in Russia and you were arrested for being an American and taken before the firing squad, and the last thing you said was, I pledge allegiance to the flag. They would say, he's embracing the Pledge of Allegiance. You just said the first line, but you mean the whole thing. Jesus said the first line of Psalm 22, but he meant the whole thing. I'll just hit three verses on it. The first line, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then, verse 24, for he has not despised or abhorred his afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard his cry. In other words, the father who I felt forsook me didn't forsake me. He was into this atonement. This was satisfying him. And then the last verse, verse 31 of Psalm 22. This is a thousand years before Jesus was born. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. It is finished. He has done it. It's done. It is finished. You cannot add to the atoning work of Jesus. If you try, you actually subtract from it. Well, I'm going to add my misery and my bad mood, and I'm going to grumble, and I'm going to complain because I messed up. That doesn't add to the atonement of Christ. You can't add to it. It's finished. He has done it. On the cross, feeling forsaken, the Father says, I haven't forsaken you. I embrace this atonement as sufficient, and you finished it. You did it. It's accomplished. And it ends this passage by saying, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Matthew says, he dismissed his spirit. He determined the moment of his death. On that cross, he said, I, I've now atoned for the sin of the world. The cosmic plan on this speck of dust, it's happened. I dismiss my spirit to my Father. Love's redeeming work Charles Wesley wrote the, remember the last two words? Love's redeeming work is done. It's done. Are you rejoicing in it? We could go on through the passage. Time won't allow us. We see the spear in his side. I will quote Zechariah 13 verse 1. On that day a fountain will be opened 
to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. That fountain has been opened. Oh, dear friends, if the secrets of your life were made into a movie, what would it be rated? I know what mine would be rated. For all sorts of reasons, violence, sex, lying, language. Oh, and if that film was put up here tonight, I would not want you to come and I would leave town as fast as I could. But it's all been paid for by Jesus. All of it. All of it. And that's the gospel of Christ. Let's stand together, shall we? Lord, we don't want to make light of sin, but we want to make much of the gospel. Lord, sin is horrible. Sin is destructive. But oh, what a savior. And you allowed a planet, you determined that a planet should go absolutely into chaos and said, that's where I will display my amazing saving power. And Lord, I pray that we will get a sense of what we're caught up in here. The display of the glory of God through the gospel to the heavenly realms. And Lord, if there's one person here this morning who is a stranger to this wonderful grace of God, oh, today, Lord, today, oh, Holy Spirit, open their hearts and compel them to come in. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.